Thanks very much for the opportunity to talk at this meeting. Um, what I'm going to describe is uh, what I think is a little bit of an experiment, really, with UK Biobank around uh, making uh, data available for research. Um, uh, because the intention of UK Biobank was to create a very large uh, resource uh, for uh, any kind of health-related research uh, that's in the public interest uh, by both academic and commercial users. Um, and unlike many such projects, uh, our job is to build it, not use it. Um, uh, and so we're trying to establish a, a structure that encourages and facilitates use by the widest range of individuals in order not only to generate um, more information ab about health, but also to help to enhance the resource for other researchers to use it. And I think that that's where there may be opportunities uh, for um, uh, commercial users of research of the resource to become um, funders of it uh, along the lines of, of Gill's talk. So just to set the scene, um, UK Biobank recruited uh, half a million men and women aged 40 to 69 between 2006 and 2010 from within the National Health Service. So they were all people who were uh, registered with the NHS um, uh, and who uh, consented to, to join this study. Uh, they gave uh, general consent for all types of health uh, related research, um, as well as re for recontact, for linkage to the health records. Um, and um, uh, uh, they also gave consent for use of the resource for both academic um, and commercial uh, researchers. We got very detailed questions and measurements and samples, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail. Uh, and then all of the individuals with their consent are being linked to their medical and other health related records uh, in, uh, I guess, in perpetuity. So as I say, um, the, 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 perhaps the key point here is that part of the consent, it was made very clear uh, that the resource was equally available for academic and commercial researchers worldwide without any preferential or exclusive access. And indeed, the model at the moment is that um, the uh, cost of using the resource is really the cost of us processing an application and providing the data. And the cost is the same, irrespective of the researcher, uh, whether they're academic or commercial, with one, with one exception being that we tend um, to uh, uh, waive the costs for, uh, for students or indeed for uh, researchers from um, resource-poor uh, settings. So in setting up uh, UK Biobank, um, there was a lot of uh, thought about what were the scientific aims and then how are we going to deliver these. So there was a combination between aims and industrial processes. So scientists came up with a very large number of questions, measurements, samples that they wanted collected, far more than were actually feasible. And the, 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 the question then was how do we develop um, a, a sort of industrial process that would allow us to get as much of that information as possible. There was also um, uh, a consideration of what were the cost-effective methods for uh, recruiting very large numbers of, of individuals. And what was very clear from the start was that the kinds of methods used in small-scale studies uh, were not going to kind of scale up uh, for large-scale studies. So we, we had a lot of discussions with people um, knowledgeable about industrial processes to see how we could use approaches that have been uh, effective in other settings to um, not only recruit but to assess these very large numbers of people uh, efficiently. This was then piloted very carefully uh, around uh, how do we identify the people. As I say, they were identified through the National Health Service. You'd think that's a straightforward thing to do. You want to get their contact details. They're in the NHS. You ask the NHS, who is one of the funders of the resource, can we have their contact details so we can invite them? And um, they say no. Uh, uh, and so we then went through a very detailed process of demonstrating that actually um, providing us with the contact details uh, contacting people, asking them to take part, was something that, that actually the vast majority of people were positive about. But this kind of piloting process then deals with some of the issues around research governance and access to, to contact information to invite people to take part in the first place. Um, then looking at this high throughput baseline assessment, piloting that, 
uh, and then around sample processing and archiving. And this was particularly um, an industrial collaboration. Uh, so we had uh, about six centres each day that were each recruiting 100 people per day, um, from whom we were taking 50 mils of blood uh, and urine and saliva into a lot of different tubes, all of which were being shipped to the coordinating centre. So every day, uh, six days a week, uh, there were thousands of samples arriving at this coordinating centre that had to be processed. And the collaboration um, in that case involved collaboration with the, the kind of obvious suspects, such as uh, groups that, de um, uh, companies that develop uh, automated um, approaches to storing samples and being able to retrieve samples uh, from frozen store, but also collaboration with companies that um, package uh, sausages, um, that can deal with things which are different size and package them in a consistent way. Because, of course, when you take a blood sample, you get different amounts of blood in the tube. When you spin the sample, you get different amounts of the different layers or the different constituents of the blood. So we had to develop robotic systems um, that didn't exist before that allowed us to spin and separate and aliquot all of these samples rather than to depend on uh, technicians. So this is the kind of industrial collaboration that went on around processing these samples at scale uh, in a way that would ensure we had a good audit trail, that we had uh, consistent processing uh, and that we um, didn't have essentially a lot of technician slaves uh, having to uh, process samples over a, a four-year period. Uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, detailed information was uh, obtained from the participants uh, and I'm just trying to give you uh, an idea, uh, particularly with respect to the sharing of data, about the kind of detail that there are uh, in these data. Um, so people spent about an hour uh, answering questions about a, a, a very wide range of um, aspects of their, their life, their medical history, their exposures, um, a, a, and a short interview as, as well. But again, this was an industrial process, if you like, with touchscreen system used to, at very low cost, obtain a large amount of information from individuals, uh, and only uh, using interview, which was face-to-face, -face, uh, for those aspects of the assessment that really couldn't be done by the touchscreen, where it required a little bit of interrogation. Then there were a number of physical measurements. And again, there was collaboration here uh, with uh, the suppliers of this equipment because typically people who are using these pieces of equipment are in interested in individuals. Um, so they are uh, doing the spirometry or doing the heel ultrasound, writing down the number. What we needed to do was get into the back of their machines and pull the data straight out of the machines into our IT system so that we avoided transcription, but also that we actually collected all of the information. So, you know, if you're a doc and you're doing spirometry, you've been taught FEV1, FVC, so how fast you blow out, how much can you blow out, and those are the two numbers that you record and the machine gives you. But what we wanted was the whole of the curve, we, because we didn't know whether that was all that was in there. Um, we won't know until uh, researchers look at the whole of the curve and see how it relates to disease. So again, collaborations with what starts out as a vendor relationship where we're buying a bit of equipment soon turns into a bit of a collaboration, more or less, where we work with them to enhance what they can give us in terms of the information. Um, and uh, then um, uh, for the latter part of the um, process, once the whole Industri industrial recruitment and assessment was working smoothly, we added in even more uh, assessments of the individuals around hearing and particularly around vision, and again, uh, working with a number of companies with quite sophisticated equipment, uh, being able to pull those data um, into our IT systems rather than having them stored on their, their systems. We had one go at seeing these individuals. So uh, when we collected the samples, we needed to collect as much sample, uh, as varied a sample, and into uh, the widest range of tubes. It would allow a, different, uh, a wide range of different kinds of assays, some of which we knew we wanted to do, and some of which we had to guess might be doable at scale at some time in the future. So we had to kind of think about how would you collect these samples in case someone wanted to do something 
that really wouldn't be feasible or maybe not hadn't been in invented. Uh, so there was a lot of piloting around um, how to collect the samples, how to process the samples, uh, and we ended up with very minimal processing locally uh, and the centralized processing that I described, um, uh, demonstrating that that would allow us to get high quality sample that was processed in a consistent way, uh, rather than uh, having inconsistent uh, rapid processing uh, um, when the sample was collected. So, as I say, we had this minimal processing, overnight transport, and then this automated blood fractionation and processing, really the first of its kind uh, that had been developed uh, for this. It could take all the tubes um, and have the robots take the tubes and turn them into uh, multiple aliquots of samples and then uh, pop them away in an automated uh, facility. So, again, um, working with the automation um, uh, partnership, developing a, an automated minus 80 um, uh, freezer facility. So we want to store these samples for decades. The problem with uh, freezers is that they tend to break down because they have moving parts. Um, uh, and so one approach that one takes is to put samples into big dumb liquid nitrogen tanks. Uh, the advantage of that is that they don't have moving parts. Um, in the long term they're relatively cost, cost effective but you can't automate them. Um, so to get samples out means sending technicians in to you know, all covered up, pulling out samples. So it's a very slow process. So, so uh, we do have our backup liquid nitrogen facility, but the automation um, uh, company worked with us to develop an automated minus 80 liquid nitrogen uh, facility, which could be uh, um, automated, use liquid nitrogen, so minimize uh, uh, moving parts, reduced cost of running it, um, and essentially, if you can imagine about a five meter high, uh, 30 meter long uh, set of filing cabinets with a robot running up and down in between these filing cabinets, with the filing cabinets cooled to minus 80 consistently across the, every single drawer, and the robot running up and down inside a minus 20 corridor. Um, it sounds easy uh, after the fact, but this is what was developed, again, a collaboration uh, with the industry to make this um, a usable resource. Because what this now means is that the money has been paid up front for you to get the samples that you want, because the robot's sitting there anyway. So it might as well pull out a few thousand samples a day uh, when you ask for them than just sit there twiddling its thumbs. So, so access is not any rapid, uh, and because it's automated, uh, it, it's accurate, but it's very low cost. And then these are all the different kinds of sample that were collected, the different kinds of fraction that were, uh, were produced, uh, and the different kinds of assays that could be analyzed. So, so all of these different fractions were produced uh, um, by the, the, the robotic system. Then once we'd um, got all the participant recruited, we were thinking, well, what else would we like to know about these individuals to enhance uh, their characterization? Activity. So when you ask people about activity, of course they lie. Uh, um, and people find it very difficult to answer standard questionnaires about activity because they're tailored for, for different kinds of people. And we did have activity questionnaires in that initial assessment, and I used to get the occasional email, email from people saying, you, I do a lot of housework, but it really isn't covered by this kind of questionnaire, or I do a lot of this. Uh, and so um, you want to uh, get direct measures of activity. Uh, but these activity monitors that you can buy are directed at individuals. They're about you, an individual looking after um, you, their health. And it will produce derived variables uh, that the company thinks might be interesting to individuals. And they're very expensive. So we worked with a Newcastle University spin-out company that had developed a much lower cost uh, activity monitor that also allowed us, uh, as with the other equipment, to get in the back of it and download all of the data uh, rather than to pull out algorithms. To develop a, a, a device that we mailed out to people, it turned itself on automatically, they put it on, it turned itself off automatically, they mailed it back. 
And so there was a lot of collaboration with that small spin-out company to be able to allow us to get 100,000 participants' um, activity. Uh, and now those data are being turned from uh, millions of data points into information about activity in these individuals that uh, researchers can use. We worked with a number of different groups, some here in, in Oxford, um, uh, uh, others in, in Cardiff, around getting more information about diet and cognition. Um, and then um, uh, it, was a, it was decided to genotype all half million participants. Uh, and the Gene Centre here in Oxford uh, led a UK-wide group of experts uh, to say, well, these are the kinds of things we'd like to uh, incorporate in uh, a genotyping array. But then um, uh, they worked with a company in California, Affymetrics, uh, who had a lot of information about um, uh, how to get best coverage um, of the genotype uh, in a particular population um, and how to build this array that would give you the maximum information. And so they designed the array in collaboration with the, the scientific team, the kinds of collaboration that Gil was talking about. Um, and then they did all of the genotyping. And there has been a back and forward of the data between California and Oxford and California and Oxford, improving the quality control uh, systems for genotyping. Because as an ignorant epidemiologist, I thought, hey, genotyping, yes, no, you know, one, zero. Uh, but what it turns out, when you do it on this kind of scale, um, there are batch effects within, um, uh, even if you're doing it all in one go, there are batch effects that can produce really quite striking spurious associations that if you don't take them into account, if you don't try to clean up the data, um, then when you make this data available as a resource for other researchers, they could easily get the wrong answer um, because of issues around quality control. So there has been this iterative process of improving the QC data systems at Affymetrics and here and back and forward. And then um, moving on from that, um, uh, we're now doing a standard pa panel of assays, about 40 different assays on the urine uh, and on the serum and uh, on the red blood cells um, uh, on all half a million participants. And again, this has moved from a vendor relationship with companies that produce equipment and, and um, reagents to produce um, uh, analytic data to a collaboration to how to make this work uh, at very large scale. Um, uh, and uh, that process is now uh, running over, uh, over the la last year, this year, and into next year. And, and here, just to give you uh, an idea of the range of different measurements, cardiovascular factors, cancer, diabetes, renal, bone and joint. Now, with respect to the genotyping and the, um, the, the other biological assays, uh, there are a number of advantages, particularly when you're trying to produce a resource for researchers to use. It's, I think, going to be largely impossible to, to share sample because it's, it's depletable. Um, I say largely impossible. I think there will be particular circumstances where one has to, to do it. Um, but uh, uh, every time you do that, then you reduce your ability to do things in the future. So wherever possible, these kinds of whole cohort sample assays, as with the genotyping or with those markers, um, allows us to reduce duplication and to increase accessibility. Because sharing data is easy. Sharing sample uh, really is not. You have uncontrolled uh, uh, processes for allowing access to samples for assays, as I say, may deplete um, the, the sample uh, resource very rapidly. Um, and so what we're looking at is you know, what are the processes that we can um, establish that will allow sharing uh, most effectively. And so one, process, one approach is to do whole cohort assays. Another approach is to say, well, at particular points in the study, there will be enough cases of a particular disease for it to be informative, pull out um, samples from those cases and match controls, and advertise that widely around um, the world and say, what are the things that you want assayed on these case control uh, sets? Um, and that may allow us to, um, uh, to, to share the sample in a controlled way. 
The problem with that is that let's say it's an, an analyte that's interesting for lots of different diseases. As with the genotyping, even more so with other kinds of assays, assays done with different pieces of equipment, with different um, reagents, produce results that can be importantly different. So if you've got one case control set done with one method, and another case control set done with another method, and another case control set done with another method, if you then want to kind of combine, you, you may well have some real problems um, uh, because they're not directly comparable. You might be able to do that with ge genetic data because there are kind of markers in there that would allow you perhaps to do some adjustment. But for many other assays, that wouldn't be possible. So it, it may be the only way for particular kinds of assays, particularly those that are very costly or very specialized. Uh, but for a resource, it makes it much less usable as a shareable resource, by contrast with this whole cohort support, uh, approach. But the genotyping, I mean, remarkably, costs 22 million pounds. I say remarkably for two reasons. Remarkably that it's so little uh, for half a million individuals, and remarkably that we managed to get 22 million pounds um, to, you, to genotype. Uh, uh, remarkably fast, actually. We, we, would, we had to spend it in a month. Um, uh, but you, actually, ge genetic costs have come down a lot. If we talk about um, things like epigenomics, if we talk about um, uh, proteomics, metabolomics, all of these things, these are not low cost. And so who's going to pay for them? And I think that this is where, again, uh, following on from Gill's talk, this is where I think uh, industry can become a funder of these kinds of projects. So you, if we wanted to sequence 500,000 people, I mean, I, I'm not sure there's anybody who knows what they would do with the data on that scale as yet, but, but it will come. Um, or to do other kinds of proteomic or other types of, of complex assays on all half million. The kind of funding required for that is unlikely to be available uh, just from government and charity researchers. But it may well be from commercial funders. I mean, for you know, they can spend half a billion dollars on a single clinical trial. So consortia, particularly of industry, may well see this as a way of making this resource useful for their research, as well as for other people's research. Another area where um, I think Biobank is, is driving these kinds of collaborations is around imaging. So we now have funding from the Medical Research Council and the Wellcome Trust, along with British Heart Foundation, to image 100,000 of the UK Biobank participants. So magnetic resonance imaging of the brain, the heart, the abdomen, low power radiation of bone joints and body, ultrasound of carotid arteries, and then a full repeat of the baseline assessment. And we've run a pilot. We're now moving into the main phase. A number of aspects of this around commercial um, collaboration. So first of all, the MR equipment is coming from Siemens. And Siemens, very you know, from the beginning, saw themselves as, we sell you bits of equipment. Now, though, it's changed very substantially. So uh, whereas the automated analysis of brain MR uh, is really quite advanced, um, uh, I think partly because the brain doesn't move, uh, it, it makes it much easier um, I suspect not very easy, but uh, uh, easier to, to pull a lot of uh, derived variables out of the MR of the brain. But for, for the heart um, uh, and for the abdomen, there really hasn't been that kind of developmental work around automated analysis. Um, and um, uh, what we've seen is that the, the, the imaging of 100,000 people is driving uh, approaches to automated analysis. So Siemens have now got their, their Princeton um, IT group uh, collaborating very closely with uh, UK Biobank uh, to look at ways in which they could really enhance the automated analysis of the, the cardiac imaging. If you decide, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you decide to do a PhD um, in um, involving cardiac imaging, then probably most of the time you'll spend over the three or four year period is drawing lines around where the heart is and then measuring by hand various measures in the cardiac imaging. Um, clearly, on 100,000 people, that's not really practical. And also, you kind of measure the things you know. 
If we think about GWAS, the whole idea of GWAS was we didn't know anything. The uh, data told us what the associations were. And it, it's quite possible that what we're going to see with big data and big data analysis is that the data will tell us what's going on. So we don't ne really necessarily want to measure particular things in these images. We want to be able to look at what are the differences between people who do and don't get disease or do or don't have something and the images. And so the ability to compare the images and assess the images on an automated scale um, re allows that kind of reverse uh, approach. Um, with respect to the um, abdomen, uh, I'll show you some data in a, in a minute, but you know, the big thing, interesting thing about, uh, about imaging the abdomen is around getting information about fat distribution particularly. Um, you'll notice with DEXA, it says bone, joints, and body. With DEXA, you can get an automated measure of the bone and joint, but also about um, fat, di uh, fat distribution. But it's a quite a crude measure, and it's a 2D measure. Whereas, in principle, the MR gives you a 3D measure and a very specific measure of different kinds of fat distribution but it's not automated. So the question is whether um, industrial collaborations can allow that uh, to be derived. So let's take that as an example. So you, when we try to get at the uh, information about um, uh, obesity or, or um, the relevance of fat um, and fat um, distribution, we use, a crude, we use crude measures, we use waist or hip circumference, we use body mass index particularly, uh, and body mass index is an incredibly uh, strong uh, predictor of disease. So these are data uh, from about 60 prospective cohorts combined to a million people, followed for about 12 years, looking at the association between bo base, uh, body mass index and the risk of heart disease and the risk of stroke. Uh, and you can see that for heart disease, five units higher bo body mass index is so about 40% higher ischemic heart disease and stroke. So um, above this kind of nadir of 25, you've got a straight line, linear relationship, heart disease and stroke. But you know, the kind of classic comment is that people like Tom Cruise have very high body mass index, not because they're fat, well, he might be now, but, you, um, but because they have a lot of muscle. Uh, and so body mass index is a very crude measure of what you're really trying to get at, and yet it's an incredibly strong predictor. So what could you do if you were really directly measuring what you want to measure? So uh, here is um, uh, another example of collaboration with, with industry. Uh, this is a, a small uh, spin-out company from a Swedish university called AMRA, uh, that have then uh, managed to get funding from Pfizer to uh, conduct, uh, to take their algorithm they've developed uh, and to use that to analyse the um, body imaging from UK Biobank. If we look at subcutaneous adipose tissue, so just under the skin, and uh, the association of body mass index is pretty good. So you think, well, body mass index is telling me all about subcutaneous tissue, what can I gain? But if you then go to visceral adipose tissue, so the fat kind of in the organs, which uh, theoretically is considered to be more, imp more important as a predictor of risk, it's less good as a, a body mass index is less good as a predictor of your visceral adipose tissue. And if you look at the association with liver fat, uh, which again might be associated uh, with disease, it's even less good as a predictor. So body mass index is a really good predictor. Think what these data uh, will allow us to do in terms of teasing apart the relevance of different kinds of adipose tissue. And different interventions have different effects. So dieting and activity have different effects on visceral and, and subcutaneous tissue. The other area where we're really struggling in this experiment is around how do you turn uh, the health record data into um, useful information. So um, we've got very large numbers of people 
all of whom over the next 10, 20 years will develop a range of different health outcomes. Uh, so we'll have very large numbers of health outcomes in very large numbers of people. Um, and if you get a specific characterization of the health outcome, so now I'm moving away from phenotyping the participants to phenotyping their health outcomes, the more specific you are, the stronger the associations. I mean, if you, if you haven't really got an accurate determination of, of the, whether or not they've really got that disease, then you can imagine that that will weaken your association. So um, being sure that someone's got the disease of interest is really quite important. Also, um, being uh, specific about the disease. So you know, when we say someone's had a stroke, well, what kind of stroke? Is it a stroke due to a clot, which might have certain causes, or a stroke due to a bleed, which might have certain other causes? Or if they have breast cancer, what kind of breast cancer? What kind of uh, markers does it have on, on the, the tumour? So again, trying to get specificity of the health outcomes will increase our ability to detect associations. And then there are the things we don't know. You know, what is the information that we should be collecting that may well be useful um, for uh, characterizing the health outcomes in greater detail when we know more? So getting tumour samples so that something that's invented in 10 years' time can be tested on the tumour to sub uh, categorize the different tumors or images or whatever. So here's an example um, uh, looking at reproductive factors and breast cancer risk. So parity, uh, age at menarche, age at first birth. By breast cancer with um, estrogen or hormonal receptors on the tumor or not. And you can see that the associations of these risk factors are very different depending on the kind of breast cancer. So if all you know is breast cancer, you get a blur. You know, you get an, an average of this. Whereas parity has no significance for Eastern receptor negative tumors, but a big significance here. And so you can see how specificity could be really important in understanding the determinants of disease. We're having to do this at scale though. So we have to have a very cost-effective, scalable approach for ascertaining the cases. So we use very crude data linking to death registers, cancer registers, episode, episode statistics. So this is discharge diagnoses. Now remember who completes these. Why are they completed? They're completed so the hospital gets paid by the government. They're completed by a clerk who is trying to read the writing or whatever information there is and characterize a complicated stay in hospital into a relatively small number of codes that relate to billing, not health. Remarkably though, those data can be fantastically good at picking up health outcomes, particularly if you have multiple sources of data, death data, cancer data, hospital data, primary care data, and then asking participants for a little bit more information, particularly about things that maybe don't get them into. Uh, hospital or to their, their primary care physician around depression, pain, um, uh, uh, cognition. Then we need to think, well, what other record sources would we not get for everybody that we might get for particular individuals that we think have, got particular, have had particular outcomes that we can then use to cross-reference to increase the probability that they've had that disease and increase the specificity of the disease outcome? And then, uh, should we go even further and get case record notes, uh, tumour collections, etc.? So the, the question here is, how does one do that at scale? And there are no established processes for doing this. So I see this as a major opportunity for collaborations between academia, uh, particularly uh, groups uh, like Gills and the Big Data Institute, but also the informatics industry, the Googles, the Apples, the whatevers of this world who take crummy data and make some sense of it. Here we're giving them really good structured data. If we can engage them in this, then they ought to be able to do very, very much more than they do with the crummy data that they have to deal with. So what are the principles of access to this data resource? It's available to all bona fide researchers. 
There's no preferential exclusive access, and as I mentioned at the beginning, it's available on the same basis for academic or commercial <coughs> researchers. I think that's a point for uh, discussion, um, but our view was that, re that commercial researchers could become um, people who effectively become funders by using it, by using their financial uh, muscle to turn uh, sample or data into information that many other researchers can be used. The, the costs of using it um, are just the costs of, of actually pulling out the data or pulling out the samples. Uh, but as I said, we're having to develop a, a very uh, controlled way of uh, dealing with the samples. There is a quid pro quo. Um, researchers are required to publish their, their findings and to return the data uh, that they have created by research users. So this is, as I say, where I can see commercial um, uh, users becoming funders by turning the um, imaging data uh, into accessible information or uh, by consortia funding sample assays that are then available uh, for other researchers. Having said that, you think, hey, you must be inundated by commercial users of this resource. You, not only are you giving the data away, but in addition, you're not even holding on to the IP. So the researcher who develops IP on this resource keeps the IP. Um, and yet we've had almost no applications from commercial users of this resource. It's taken us some time to get uh, above 50% of non-UK researchers using it. We've now got to that. But still, very few uh, commercial um, users. We spent the last year um, in detailed discussions with a major informatics company, going back and forward on whether or not they could get the data. Um, and in the end, um, uh, Jonathan Sellers, who's the company secretary for uh, UK Biobank and as an IP lawyer as well, wrote an email saying, truly, there really are no catches. Yeah. <laughs> because essentially, industry doesn't believe it. That's been our biggest problem. So you know, in, in conclusion, with, with um, uh, access to kind of cohorts like this, uh, there are a number of different problems that we're trying to address. Uh, insufficient specificity about the disease outcomes. Actually, all of the focus in these kinds of cohorts is about characterizing the participants. There's been very little focus on characterizing their health outcomes, and yet that, as I hope I've indicated, um, is really very important uh, if we're to uh, pick up uh, the true associations. Data inaccessibility. Um, researchers in the main are good at dealing with the data they're used to dealing with and not with other data. Your geneticists are great with genetics data, but they're not epidemiologists. Epidemiologists couldn't make sense of, of imaging data if you know, it was given to them. So how do you make lots of different types of complex data accessible to all the different kinds of researchers that want to use it. How do you make them even understand what the data are? Um, how do they visualize it? Uh, and again, I think that this is um, an issue around um, opportunities for collaboration with commercial um, enterprises. And in fact, this morning, we had a discussion uh, with, with another a company about how could, we, how could they help and collaborate and use Biobank as an exemplar around how to, 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 make, it, to make the data um, easily visualized by a researcher who's thinking about using it. How do we manage the depletable samples? How do we get bigger investment in turning the sample uh, into uh, shareable information? Um, and how do we keep the whole process of using the resource very simple uh, so that um, uh, people are not put off uh, using it, either by real or by perceived obstacles? And so far, I think the biggest problem has been the perceived obstacles. Thank you very much.